Hey, I'm Elma Begovic. I co-wrote um, and produced the short film, The Day We Left, and I star in it as well. I play the lead character, Nura, and you're watching the film Craziest Show. Awesome. Great to have you here, Elma. Nice. Thank you for having me. No worries. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to make sure my phone is on silent. It rang the other day during an interview and it like threw me off. <gasps> you have to buy drinks when that happens. <laughs> oh, really? I did not know that rule. <laughs> yeah, the rule on set is if, you're, if your phone goes off during like a take, you owe everybody a round of drinks or <laughs> something like that. That never happened to you? <laughs> yes, once on an indie. Uh-huh. I, I treated a round of drinks. I screwed up the shot, so I treated everyone for drinks. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> now, do you want to start with your short film or do you want to get the the bite conversation first? And then, yeah, we can talk about bite for sure. sure. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll just, I'll, it's been, I only have like a couple questions about bite. So I'll just start with that. Um, so that was your second film, but your first, I feel like, big film. So mm -hmm. how did that come about for you? Oh man, um, yeah, Byte was really my introduction to indie uh, filmmaking, especially genre filmmaking. It was my first like project that I booked when I moved to Toronto. Um, I always laugh when I think about this. I auditioned for that movie with my headshot was a selfie. I remember it very well. Uh, the casting director for that movie, Ashley Hallahan, she's a great casting director out in Toronto. Uh, she put me forward for the role and said, you know, you need some headshots. And I was like, I had just moved to Toronto, didn't know anyone. I was like, okay, in my bathroom, like taking a selfie, quickly get it printed. And um, that's sort of what got, got my foot in the door. Um, yeah, it's a genre movie, very like body horror, um, quite inspired by Cronenberg's The Fly, of course. And um, yeah, it's truly when I think of independent horror filmmaking, that's that's bite. You know, it was made for a pretty small budget uh, with a great crew of people. Um, the director and producers at Black Fawn were awesome to work with. Um, but uh, like any project, it was, you know, the stepping stone into the career and genre movies are, you know, I, I didn't know that at the time, but it's like where everyone gets started because they are the at that time, the cheapest and quickest movies to make. And so I think a lot of actors, you know, have to earn their stripes in horror before they can venture out into other uh, journeys. And Bite just happened to be one of those movies that resonated with people. It was very gory, very visual. And uh, when it came out, that was like what people were wanting to see. I'll have to admit, you know, I've only seen it once. <laughs> it's hard to watch yourself on screen in general, but especially when you're playing like a, you know, gory bug monster that's just killing and eating everything. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't watch all of it just because I was I just, even looking at the images, it's like, okay, that is really creepy. I don't know you if I can know, do that yet. Yeah, and uh, I remember we had the screening for Byte at the Fantasia Film Festival. This was, I think, in 2016. And during our premiere, uh, multiple people fainted and, and, and an ambulance had to be called. And I just remember think, sitting in the seats thinking, damn, my parents are going to have to watch this. How do I like, how do I sell them on this? You know, I come from an immigrant household where my parents sure. didn't necessarily like foster my love for uh, storytelling and movie making. And so my first movie being a, a horror movie, and that was like the first body of work they were going to see of mine. It was a pretty <laughs> scary situation, but um, yeah, it was a fun movie to make for sure. Did they ever watch it? Yes, actually, it screened in Edmonton, where my parents live, um, and they went to see it, and they were both quite proud. I remember I sent a, a, a high school friend of mine to go with them. You know, there's a simulated love scene in it as well, and I was still very green as an actor then and was quite nervous about all of those things, you know, coming out. Um, and so I was worried about how my parents would react to that. You know, even though it's acting and storytelling, sometimes it's hard for people who love us to like separate us from the, the characters we play. Um, okay. But they received it very well. And uh, yeah, they've only ever seen it once as well. <laughs> I think once is enough. <laughs> yeah, I think in general for bite, like once is enough. <laughs> yeah. If, if people are fainting or vomiting during it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Moving past that now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly now uh yeah that's interesting I didn't realize that it was a black fawn film because I had talked with Chad and uh, Cody Callahan about the Elk Room and Vicious Fun so I thought that was kind of cool like knowing that was kind of their early days as well 
Like, yeah, I got the you know joy of working with both of them. Um, Cody produced by uh, Chad directed. There was one scene that Cody was really adamant about uh, directing in Byte as well, or DPing. And I remember he hopped behind the camera, and then I got to work with him a little bit too. Um, yeah, they're great guys. They have you know a penchant for telling genre films, and out in Toronto, they really are the guys who make um, horror movies happen. And it was a pleasure to work with them. Now, I'd also love to ask, just like, because in that film, the first, I guess, eight minutes are found footage. Yeah. So is that cool for you, like being on your second project and kind of like learning like, like that shooting style and do, acting that way? Yeah, I think found footage has to, you know, in storytelling, it has to fit, you know, the scope that you're putting it into. I think it worked really well for Byte in the beginning. We got a nice little mini vacation to the Dominican Republic out of it. I mean, who who doesn't want to, you know, go on holiday while they have to work? <laughs> um, but I'll be honest, it was really, it was the, you know, the first big project I worked on as an actor. Um, and there was looking, you know, we, as an actor, when you look back at any of your work, you're always looking for all the things that you could have done better and you could fix. And uh, if, you know, if I'm looking, if I'm watching Byte for the acting and for the work that I did in it, there's, you know, a copious amount of notes I could have of how it could have, you know, been executed better on my end. But um, I think just getting the opportunity as an actor to be able to, to, to do what you love, like we, we get so little of that as actors, you know, it's a lot of auditioning and getting no's so that when you are given a yes, you really just try to make the most of it. And that's what Bite was for me, it was an opportunity to get, you know, into the genre world, try to tell a story and, you know, try to learn as much as I could. Um, for my, you know, for being one of my first projects, it's it's armored me with some good knowledge for sure. And being like one of your first projects, I mean, I don't think it happens every day that you're kind of like almost like this big horror villain in a way. <laughs> yeah, which I loved, you know, I, and I wish I would have run like further with it like that that character starts out as like a nice, you know, nice woman who then just goes ape shit. And I was like, man, Elma, you could have really leaned into that a little more. Uh, we'll save it for the next one. <laughs> now, my last one for Bite would just be, um, long did it take to do the monster makeup on you? Oh gosh, I think the final look, like my last day, I always joke about this because, um, when we shot Bite, it was an indie, so you can't get away with that on like union work anymore. But um, I think my longest day in the makeup chair was like seven hours uh, because by the final look, like it's I'm in full prosthetics. It's like, you know, prosthetics from head to toe, a bald cap and then all of the like extra makeup uh contact lenses like I couldn't even see I think but the the last contact lenses by the end of the movie like I had a chaperone the makeup artist would like walk me around <laughs> set because I couldn't fully see um so I would say my longest work day on that movie ended up being like 28 hours because I did seven hours in the chair then we filmed for like a long ass time it was like the last day of shooting and then I got in a car and drove from I think it was Hamilton, like back to Toronto. And uh, I just remember thinking, wow, that was a long work day. <laughs> Holy crap. But I guess, I guess it makes sense because they're not going to, they don't really want to make you go through that seven hours again. But yeah, I guess that's a long day, 28 hours. Yeah. You got to really like the people you work with if you're spending seven hours getting touched up and, you know, having people put makeup on you. Seven hours to make you look worse <laughs> than when you came in. <laughs> That's a funny way of looking at it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thank you for letting me ask him about Bite. Uh, we'll get right into uh, the day we left. The Slovenians didn't have a poem separated. Why should we? Geography, religion, army. You pick one. Everyone is heading down the mountain to Sarajevo. How are you coming? No, we are going into Serbia. From now on, it's better if you look and act like a Serb. The film is set in Yugoslavia in 1991 and is based on your own family's experiences escaping Bosnia. So it's such a personal story. So what was the writing process like? 
Um, so yeah, the, the short story is actually based um, more on uh, director Kyle Katherner's uh, friend's experience. He is okay. a this Canadian filmmaker who lives in Vancouver, um, makes documentaries, music videos, short films. And uh, he actually reached out to me because he had started with this concept. He met a friend uh, traveling. Uh, she told him uh, her story about her family leaving Bosnia. And he was like, I want to make I want to make a movie out of that. And he reached out to me about writing with him. And that's how we got the process going. Um, and, you know, being from Bosnia myself, I had said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of writing something similar. We can maybe blend these stories together. And so the short film that we shot in uh, Vancouver that you watched is um, a combination of the Hodzic family story and then, you know, peppered in with a little bit of my family's experience. Um, and then the feature film that I'm currently working on for the same project um, is really like a combination of uh, their escape story, my family's escape story. I did a lot of interviews with other Bosnian families who went through similar situations and brought all of those stories into the, the feature, which we're currently working on. Okay. Did you talk with your own family at all and just kind of get their experiences or do you remember enough to tap into your own experiences? Yeah, I was, you know, I was quite young. I was three and a half when the war started and my family were asylum seekers in uh, Berlin during the war. So I always grew up knowing that, you know, there was a country or there was a war in my country. And that's why I was living as an Ausländer in Berlin, as they say. Um, but of course, yeah, my mother and father definitely, even when we immigrated into Canada, you know, upheld our values and traditions and our culture. And we're always very adamant about you know letting us know where we came from what our story is and as soon as we got you know our Canadian citizenship and our passports like I spent all of my summers uh, uh, in Bosnia back home with my grandmother my aunts my uncles my extended family um, yeah it was challenging you know it's it's hard to sit down with your with you know your mother and your father and to hear them you know tell you about how they left their home country and what you know trials and tribulations they had to endure just to get you know to safety um, and I really tried to resonate that with with my writing to make sure that I honored the the journey and the experiences that you know our friends and family went through that I interviewed as well as the Hodzic family but to also you know be mindful of the fact that a lot of these stories and reminiscing are also you know they trigger feelings of a lot of PTSD and, 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 and can be challenging, you know, um, though this war happened 20 some years ago, it, you know, it's after uh, effect lingers in people in very different ways. And um, I still know a lot of Bosnian people who, who are dealing with PTSD and, and, and managing a lot of their trauma from, you know, the time that they endured during the Bosnian war. Okay. And just speaking of that PTSD and the trauma, like, how has this whole experience been therapeutic for you? I think so. I think there's always like catharsis in, in writing, you know, and I think that's the writer in me. That's my favorite part about storytelling is I feel like I write because I have to get some things off my chest. And um, this story in particular many people have said, oh, you should, you know, you should write about this. You should try and get this made. And, you know, the truth is, we have a great shift in the industry now where, you know, diverse storytelling and stories centered on marginalized or underrepresented communities are now coming to light. But like when I was starting out as an actor, it's not like producers were knocking on, on doors trying to get these stories, especially war dramas or escape stories or female centered films for that matter. Um, so I, I've always, you know, toyed with the idea of, of, of putting this out, but it is also very personal. And I think that that part is always going to be a little bit challenging for everyone involved. Um, we screened the short film at the 35th Edmonton Film Festival in October, and my parents got to see it for the first time, as well as my sister and uh, some of my Bosnian friends and family. And yeah, it was a mix of Yes, we're excited that, you know, Elma made a movie and like it looks good and all that. But there were also moments of 
oh, wow, like this is tough to watch. And, you know, we used a lot of my family's like heirlooms as set deck, like the headscarf I wear in the movie and the earrings belong to my grandmother. So every time I got ready on set, you know, I was also bringing a piece of home with me. Um, a lot of like the, the set decorations that we used, you know, like the coffee cups, uh, all that, like that, that all came from, from my house, from my parents that they brought from Bosnia to Canada with them. So like little trinkets of our life life were kind of peppered throughout the movie which was nice oh, that's that's beautiful actually like like just a little piece of home like in every scene I guess yeah that's awesome you were mentioning just like getting like a lot of nose when we were talking about bite just like getting nose as an actor so is that why you're kind of kind of taking it into your own hands like writing producing like so you can instead of pitching to other people I mean I, I guess you would still have to pitch but just yeah. you're able to create your own story yeah, I think it's a, a mixture of those things. I think um, I moved to LA with, you know, a couple of credits under my belt and thought I'm going to, you know, come into this industry and just, you know, swoop them by storm. And, you know, the reality is there are there are way more uh, applicants than there are jobs. And uh, after about a year of just having even a hard time getting an audition in LA, I just realized I really miss storytelling, like at the at the heart of you know, like what I do, that's what I like doing. I like telling stories. And when you go a long time without having the ability to do that, like something just starts itching in you. You're like, I gotta, I gotta get a story out. Um, so that's really what prompted me into making my own stuff. I started my own uh, production company and made my first short film out in Toronto with uh, same thing, a group of friends who were willing to help me, you know, put my vision out there. And yeah, I think once you, once you see something through from inception to like playing it on a screen, it's really hard to go back to waiting for permission, like waiting for somebody to say to you, okay, you've got this part. Now you can go and, and, and act and you can go do what you love. I think once you get your, once you dip your feet into the making it yourself, like vibe, you just can't, like I am addicted now. And we're, you know, two and a half ways two and a half years after making my first short film here, you know, this is the third short film that I've, you know, been uh, involved in from like inception to production to seeing it through. And um, it's, it's what I've, it's, I really like it. So I think it's, it's where I see my, myself continuing. Um, indie filmmaking is not easy. <laughs> it comes with a, a whole set of headaches that you have to deal with. But I think the end result where you create a body of work that you most of the time have ownership of, and also like you had a huge part in, in, in like the creative aspect of it is, yeah, like the actor in me never, never had that privilege. You know, as an actor, you book your role, you show up on set, you facilitate your job, and then it's kind of out of your hands. But when you get involved on the production side, you just, you have a lot more control. And um, I like having that seat at the table. So I'd like to keep nourishing that and keep bringing other indie filmmakers, especially from underrepresented communities in to, to also start growing. Okay, awesome. Now, when you first came, you first came to Edmonton when you were like eight-ish, maybe nine? 10, 10 11, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so somewhere in there. Uh, and you started taking acting classes when you were a teen. So what drew you to acting? And did you ever envision yourself being where you are today, just talking about how you're writing and producing now too? No, I think I, I always make this, I say this because it's honestly true. If you would have told like six-year-old Elma that grew up in a Berlin refugee center that someday she'd be, you know, living in LA and actually making movies for a living. You know, I don't think I would have believed that. I'd be like, pinch me, are you lying? <laughs> but um, uh, I have always wanted to do this. Yeah, I think I was like four years old when my twin sister and I first started putting on like plays in, in, in Germany where we lived and we would charge people like 15, 25 cents to come in and like watch our shows. Um, and when I moved to Canada, it was uh, partly to learn English, like it's a great way to, to immerse yourself in a language like I moved to Canada not speaking, you know, I think I knew three words in English so acting classes helped with the language acquisition helped me shed my accent a little bit because like kids are cruel and when you move at like, when you move to a new country as a teenager and you have an accent and like, you know, kids can kids pick away at that quickly so. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's really how the acting classes started uh, as a ways to learn English and to just feed my creativity more. Okay. Now, going back to the plays with your twin, was that yeah. like your biggest memory from Germany? Probably, yeah. I mean, those were dire times. You know, my family and I, we were asylum seekers. It were pretty grim times. Our family was sure. kind of scattered all over Europe at the time. We weren't sure what was going on, like where everybody was. Um, and my parents were just as a ways of keeping us entertained, like the TV was always on. So I was constantly consuming movies dubbed in German, might I add. Um, I'll never forget when I first moved to Canada and watched like Mrs. Doubtfire for the first time. And I heard Robin Williams's real voice. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like the, the Mrs. Doubtfire that I grew up watching in Germany. <laughs> oh, that's um, funny. Yeah. <laughs> Would would like the the dubber for Robin Williams be the same in Germany for like all of his movies? Probably. Yeah, I do remember that like they kept the same actor for the same like big A lister, so they would have like a consistent voice uh, in German, for example. Mm -hmm. I gotta find out who that was. Who like who yeah. your Robin Williams would have? Been. Yeah, yeah, that was a surreal thing, you know. Like most of the the first uh, American like Hollywood movies that I consumed as a child were all dubbed in a different language. And so then I got to re kind of re, I got to be reintroduced to them when I moved to Canada and started like watching them in, you know, in actual English. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Now does your twin still do plays or anything? No, <laughs> no, she's a teacher and, uh, yeah, like somebody I, I truly admire. She's a mom, a teacher. Uh, cool. She was a full-time student this year while raising her kids and, you know, being essentially a frontline worker. So um, she does far more important things. She shapes young minds. Awesome. I mean, you, you do too. I mean, young mm -hmm. minds might see, see bite. They might see this film. <laughs> <laughs> they might never want to go on vacation. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, bug bite, go to the hospital right away. That's right. <laughs> Now, uh, what does she, what does she think about your films? Like, does she enjoy them too? Yeah, I would say my family is finally getting around to being supportive. Um, okay. Well, so my sisters have always been really like they've been my biggest cheerleaders. Um, I've always I've always been a creative kid, and I've always you know been writing in a notepad. Like it started with poems and like little songs and like lyrics I would write for you know crushes I had, and then you know, turned into short stories and eventually scripts. And I, you know, always enjoyed performing and they were always there to like help facilitate that. Okay. Now talking about the writing, kind of going back when you would mention that your director, uh, Kao, is that how Kyle. you say it? Kyle. Kyle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Kyle. Um, with him having his own scripts and then kind of approaching you and you were working on your own. So can you talk about what your script was like before merging with him to make The Day We Left? Yeah, I mean, very similar. Um, my script was more focused on the love story between my mom and dad when they met and like what their what their journey looked like falling in love prior to a war. Um, but when Kayo appro approached me, he already had a pretty set idea of what what he was looking to write and he had had he had a uh, short film already written so when I came on board he invited me to co-write the short film that you you got to watch um, but for the feature he's been really like carte blanche kind of I've been I got to write uh, you know obviously he gave me some notes of what he, what you know specific beats he'd like to see in the in the feature but then it was like I just locked myself in a room for a few weeks and like got the first draft done um now we're working on the second one and same thing I tend to just write and then send it over they read it I get my notes review and then I go back and, and write some more um that's awesome. sort of been the process okay and now um I feel like telling your parents love story is such like a sentimental like baby in a way. So is that ever going to be, is that going to be in the future? Or is that going to be in future films? There are definitely uh, moments of that in the future that I'm rewriting. So um, like I said, the, the, the day we left is really a combination of, of a lot of uh, Bosnian people's stories put together, like in my vortex, same with the Hodzic family. And so for the feature, yeah, there'll definitely be some, some tender moments. Like the short film is really, you're catching sort of this family at the, 
the height of, of, of like what's going on. And in the future, there's, you know, there's room for some breathability. So there'll, there'll be some tender moments that will hopefully make their way on, on screen as well. <laughs> okay, I'm excited. I'm excited. Cool. Oh, so this film is shot in Vancouver and it's having its premiere at its hometown premiere at Vancouver Short Film Festival from January 30th to February 6th. Mm -hmm. So there's like so much talent on display here. So what does that mean for your team to have its local premiere? I mean, I wish that it were in person. Um, unfortunately, it's all virtual this year. Um, it's it's just a, a big deal. You know, we uh, made this project with uh, Vancouver-based and BC-based cast and crew. And so many people came aboard and just poured all of their love and energy into it. You know, um, our producers, our crew, our talented cast, like everyone showed up for this project and like they showed so much love for it. So it would have been great to celebrate in person with everyone, but hopefully we'll have a chance to do that later in the year. Um, hopefully. Yeah, and I think, you know, we shot a lot of, a lot of the stuff was shot out in Abbotsford on a farm and we worked so tirelessly. And I have to give credit to Kayo whose family, you know, his family roots are, uh, they're Swiss uh, butchers. And so he grew up on like farm life and he had such an adamant vision about making sure that uh, the, to the topography of Vancouver and BC would really mirror what Bosnia looked like in 92. And so we worked really hard to make our set look and feel like a Bosnian countryside. And uh, I remember like when um, even the Hodjic family watched it or uh, some of our friends, like our editor who's Croatian, when he showed it to his mom, she was like, when'd you guys go to Bosnia? Oh, really? <laughs> they were like, no, that's BC. Um, so just a, a, a great like, a great representation of what like what talent lingers in Vancouver. There's just so many cool creative people who can make projects happen on on you know the smallest budgets. That's amazing because like literally that's how my questions like how you guys made Vancouver look like Bosnia, mm -hmm. and like so what was the location scouting like and finding that village and decorating it? I guess exhausting. I think Kyle drove around all of rural BC until he found like what worked. We uh, He visited a bunch of farms, you know, did a lot of like walkthroughs, took pictures. We did FaceTimed a bunch. Um, you know, we shot this during COVID. We shot during uh, summer of 2020, but like all of our prep was happening like right at the beginning of the pandemic. So there was a lot of like things that we still had to figure out and we were kind of rolling with the punches, but yeah, it was just a, a strenuous amount of, of research, a lot of driving around looking for things, but it paid off because I do think that, you know, visually the movie is quite stunning. And uh, I'm not just saying that because I was involved in it, but I do think, I think yeah. it's... <laughs> it is. <laughs> now uh do you enjoy that process of of finding the locations and then kind of i feel like it's a eureka moment where you're like okay this this is where we're filming yeah for sure um prior to the day we left i i um I produced and starred in a short film called Performance Anxiety, also kind of a genre movie um, with uh, LA based director Trey Anderson. And I remember we drove out to Palm Springs to search for locations. And when we found like the ratty hotel that we were gonna film a lot of our scenes in, yeah, it was like that moment where you're like, yes, I found this location. Let me lock it down. Let me make sure no one steals it from me. Because as soon as you find a location that fits the story, like your mind already starts visualizing like the characters, what they're wearing, what the set deck is. And then you just want to like, you want to start, you know, you want to start getting all the things you need to facilitate that. So yeah, it's a huge weight lifted off your shoulder when you find a good, um, a good location. Have you ever had like a moment where like you find this good location, but then it falls through? Like, do you usually have a backup plan or what's that like? Um, I've been blessed enough with, um, with not having to get a backup location for sure. But sometimes, you know, you'll book a location and it's great when you're testing and then you get there day of and you realize, oh, you only have a limited amount of time to be there or, oh, shoot, they won't let you like, you know, paint a wall or do, so, you know, move, move things around. And then you kind of have to, you have to pivot. But for the most part, yeah, it's, it's, it's been good. No, not too many big issues. Okay. And now the town that you guys filmed in is called Abbotsford. Mm -hmm. Now is the, the, is that beautiful Valley? Is that right by it? Or was that like at a different town? No, it's, oh, um, 
oh shoot I should know where that is that there's one shot where the main character Nuda is looking like at her village and yes. that wasn't even in Abbotsford we drove somewhere like six hours outside of Vancouver just to get that one shot I can't remember the name of the town I'll have to I'll have to talk to Kyle but yeah we we definitely did a lot of driving around to find find specific shots but yeah there were specific shots that Kyle just like could not sacrifice and you know, we hopped in a car for six hours one way just to get that one shot and it was worth it. Honestly, like that was my most memorable moment in the film. So I'm glad you guys got it because like just her looking over, it's, it's a village, right? Just yeah. looking over her own village kind of thing. And I just, I love the sentiment of how she has her bike. She sees it in the day. It's like, ah, I love this place. And then at night, it's a very different tone. So can yeah. you talk about the cinematography in that moment and just you two writing that scene those pair of that pair of scenes I suppose yeah I mean our cinemato our DP for this project was amazing um Jan he just talented guy I think he's one of those people that also like art visually artistically is drawn to things and I feel like as soon as we explained what we as soon as Kyle like explained his vision Jan knew what he needed to do um that scene in particular is tough because it's there's a lot of internal stuff going on like on the outside we're seeing the village but it's also a, a big uh, you know like thematically it's a moment where our, our lead character's world is like falling apart essentially and um, so I think that the the nice like visual a, a, um, accompaniment like of that village plus her like standing on top is just like Kind of supposed to tug at your heartstrings a little bit, but I think that what you know, like uh, symbolically, what we were going for was exactly that, like matching her internal journey to like an exterior big uh, picture. It's great, and is that or is that one of the shots that might make it to the feature? I sure hope so. Um, we're so we're so early in like the feature process, you know, we're sure. writing and applying for grants and it's it's a lot of work to get um, an independent feature made, um, but we're so hopeful that that'll happen. And yeah, Kayo is a huge, um, like he, I, what I love about him as a storyteller is like everyone focuses on on showcasing like the hustle and bustle of city life, but like he's really drawn to showing what like the the village experience looks like and what like you know a humble quiet life in in a farming community might look like and so visually I do lean on him a lot for that because a it's like he has the life experience and b like when he has a vision in his head he'll be able to pull up like a a, a location in BC and be like here we can shoot in Chilliwack this totally matches because he does that for fun like he's out camping and snowboarding and skiing through avalanches like it's just something he enjoys doing oh, awesome. like I'll just sit here and have this coffee <laughs> like I'm good just holing up in my house writing yeah he, I'll stay yeah. here where it's safe <laughs> now it sounds to me like he's a very like visual director but is he also like a direct uh, an actor's director too I think so yeah this was my first time being directed by him and I hope it's not my last um yeah, a great storyteller as well. And same thing, he's very multifaceted, works in, you know, different aspects of the industry. So I think when you have experience in different pockets, it's easier to communicate with people. Um, you know, I'm an actor, but I also produce and write. And so when I get on set, sometimes um, I'm not needed as an actor, I'm needed in the other, other uh, capacities. So it's good to have a little bit of everything, I think. Are you virtually on set every day then with those, all those roles? Yes and no. I'm I'm spending a lot of time writing. I'm in a writer's room right now for a sci-fi show out in Vancouver as well. Um, so it's a lot of Zoom meetings and it's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of me and my computer time right now. But uh, the industry is back up. Auditions are coming back in. So I've had my first audition of 2022. I'm sure more will start rolling in and we'll see where the year takes me. How the audition go? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, it was a, it was a good ease into, into the year. <laughs> okay. And can you talk about the sci-fi writing room at all? Not yeah. Really. Um, uh, it's a optimistic sci-fi show. Um, it's helmed by a, a Vancouver production company, Trembling Void. And our showrunner is Amy uh, Fox, Vancouver-based uh, actor, producer as well. It's, um, 
it's an early, uh, like we're, we're writing the first season right now, just got a um, story editor that came on board that I'm sure we'll be able to talk about in the future. But um, yeah, it's an optimistic sci-fi. It's basically a group of like, uh, it's like a nonprofit in space 200, 300 years from now. And they're basically just trying to keep uh, things copacetic and like, every episode they're faced with some challenges and uh, it's my first it's my first sci-fi writers room and it's also my first time working with like more than three other writers um and again working with a really really great group of Vancouver based writers and creators on this project as well and it's been a fun journey we shot um, a sizzle for it in August um mm -hmm. last summer at Emily Carr and uh, that should be coming out soon oh that's awesome and just um with all the personalities in the writing room, what does uh, write, like collaborating with all those writers, what does that teach you for just like being a team player, I guess? In sci-fi? Um, or just I'm in just, general? Oh, uh, for this project, um, I'm just learning that like listening, listening is so key. Um, I think when you work with other people, sometimes we all think that we have the next great idea or we're eager to pitch and we just want to like get our turn. But I find that like giving the floor to people and letting them get their vision out is, is good too. Um, okay. What I'm enjoying about being in a writer's room on it, it's just, it's like feeding off of energy, you know, um, writing is like a lonely sport for many people and we become like used to that so then when like other people get involved it can it can you know like sometimes I'm scared that an idea I have or a pitch I want to give is like stupid or that it won't resonate with anyone and people are awesome like in in, in my sci-fi writer's room like sometimes I'll pitch and they'll be like not quite, but thank you for like, thank you for your, your recommendation, you know, and it's, it's not at all as scary as I thought it would be. Um, I'm loving it. Yeah, it's a great experience. Oh, that's awesome. And I feel like I feel like that's something I'm learning as well, just with like me being like, if someone if I'm interviewing someone and they say something interesting, I want to like almost jump in with like, okay, this is when I can insert a joke or something. And sometimes it's just better to be like, okay, sit back and let them talk. Yeah. Yeah, like I live for a good joke, like a good one liner. Somebody says something, I just want to swoop in and add to it. But sometimes it's more beneficial to just let someone get their idea across. Um, for Synthesis, for example, the sci fi show that I'm working on, um, some of these writers are just so much more experienced in writing science fiction that some meetings I just want to sit there and listen. I'm like, you talk and I'll learn. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you can't be the expert uh, in every situation and in every room. Room. And I'm finding, I'm learning that if I'm the person that's like talking all the time in the room, I am not in the right room. <laughs> I'd much rather shut up and learn from others. Okay. Fascinating. And you got to find the balance too of being like, okay, am I not saying enough? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now I, I just look about questions here. Oh, okay. So I actually have two more. Um, so I found that there's a lot of authenticity authenticity in the short in general but the radio news reports did you guys record those for the film or were those like archive footage um so the radio <laughs> I love it I'm gonna give my brother-in-law a shout out um yeah the radio it's definitely um it's my brother-in-law reenacting it <laughs> my oh, twin cool. sister's husband I like found him and said, hey, I need you to record these lines in Bosnian for me. But the words he's saying are actually transcribed from like a real uh, news station. Yeah. And it was during like when when things were getting heated, um, radio outlets would like let, you know, people know, hey, like you guys need to start packing up and stuff like that. But uh, it's not original. It's my brother in law. <laughs> oh, OK. Great radio voice. <laughs> I'll make sure to tell him that. He's a dad, so he's got a pretty authoritative voice. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, do you, I feel like you would have been too young, but do you like remember at all, like hearing those first radio reports or does your family remember that? Um, I don't. I, like I said, I was, you know, three and a half, four when we left Bosnia, like sure. my memories are pretty, pretty scattered. Um, but no, like, you know, I have retellings of my mom, for example, like she'd come home from work, she's a seamstress by trade. And like, she'd come home and say, hey, like there were, you know, chatter, chatter around my factory, or like my dad would come home and say, hey, there's been chatter around my work and stuff like that. Um, I don't remember specifically 
if like my parents got, you know, like heard it on the news or, or over the radio. Um, I think it was more so like within the community, they could tell that things were shifting, their neighbors were changing, um, you know, like, my mom came home from work one day and like our our neighbors across the street who um were Serbian like the kids just started throwing rocks at my mom and she was like what you know like subtle like little things like that that led my parents to to know that something was about to happen oh okay so it's a bit more impactful than the radio in that way <laughs> okay um Jesus sorry my frame stops because I've some I'm just gonna say it I'll probably cut it out but I was just like impactful I did not mean that to be a rock pun no but good one (laughs) hey I live for a good pun too okay I'll I'll keep it in I but I just sometimes I like I'm like okay should I say it should I I say it I don't know safe space safe space (laughs) okay good um also uh you said you mentioned your mom was a seamstress so is she ever able to provide like clothes or anything for your films um, she helped, uh, actually Kyle's partner, uh, Danielle helped with a lot of the clothes. She's a seamstress. Um, so shout out to her. My mom used to make my clothes when I was younger. Yeah. Um, my mom like sewed all of our clothes for a long, long time. Um, when I moved to Canada was like when my sisters and I made the shift into asking, you know, for money so we could go to forever 21, because again, we just <laughs> wanted to fit in. So it's like, you're, you know, when I moved to Canada, it wasn't cool for your mom to be making your clothes. But now in 2022, if your mom is making your clothes, like you're, you're a cool kid, like that's the hipster thing to do now. Yeah. I feel like we were born in the wrong time. In that yeah. <laughs> now you mentioned earlier, just that, like, you kind of have like a piece of home in a lot of the scenes in the short film. Um, so did you have a favorite object? I think my grandmother's earrings, um, they, uh, she left them for my mom. My mom's had them for years. They're nothing special. They just are authentic, tiny little pearl, pearl bits. But I just remember my grandmother wearing those earrings when I was a child. She wore them through the war. She wore them after the war. She wore them while she waited to get her land back. Like those earrings like symbolize a lot of her strength. And I just really wanted to work them into the script. And there was one scene when uh, it was appropriate for my character to be a little bit more dolled up. And so I asked, I asked Kyle, you know, like, can we use these, these earrings? And he gave the go ahead. And I think that's probably my favorite piece. That's great. It's lots of history with it too, right? Now- so your mom lent them to you kind of thing? Yeah, everything was that. I had to give it back for sure. <laughs> okay. Now I'd love to ask just to, that was it for my questions and it's 5.53, 2.53 for you. Um, so do you have anything, we've talked about a lot of what you're working on, but do you have anything you want to plug? I would like to say, I would like to say, <laughs> um, another thing, I'm, I mean, I'm obviously really passionate about, you know, stories of immigration and what that looks like. I'm being an immigrant myself, have now called multiple countries home and gone through the process of, you know, moving and obtaining citizenships. And so that's really something that I'm exploring right now with the rest of my writing. And I am currently working on trying to get my first uh, scripted series off the ground that will really tackle, you know, the theme of uh, immigration. Now, uh, and also just to plug where people can find the film, uh, where's my notes here? It will be playing at the Vancouver Short Film Festival from January 30th to February 6th. Um, And now that's online. Is it only, can only Canadians watch it or can Americans watch it as well? That's a good question. I don't know what the like geo restrictions are. I think it might just be in Canada, but we are, we're at the, you know, beginning of our festival run. So we are hopeful that we'll be screening um, in LA as well. And hopefully get some more, um, at least one Vancouver screening for all the cast and crew. I'd love to thank you, Alma Begovic, for coming on the Film Craziest Show, chatting the day we left, uh, Bite, and just other elements of your career. It's been, it's been fun. Thank you so much. You as well.